What I want to do today is to discuss uh, protein surface interactions in relation to biocompatibility. And um, what I hope to be able to convince you of the overarching importance of uh, protein surface interactions for biomaterials and biocompatibility. And this kind of leads me into a subtitle for the talk, which, which might be that. And so I hope that, I think that one can possibly make a case that you could design for biocompatibility by controlling protein surface interactions. And since the work that we have done is mostly in relation to the blood biomaterial interface, uh, I, give, I put those words into that subtitle. So just to remind you, probably this isn't necessary for this group, I'm not sure, but um, remind you of some of the applications of blood, contact bi blood contacting biomaterials. The first group at the top of the slide are for devices that are implanted completely within the circulatory system. And the three at the bottom are for extracorporeal blood material contact systems. This is only a partial list, of course. There are many more that one could add to that. What are the problems with blood contacting biomaterials? A few of them are listed there, just again to remind you. Immune response, often involving complement activation. Inflammatory response involving white cell surface interactions. Infection is usually lurking in the background if one isn't careful. Um, the material itself can be degraded. Of course, the, the blood and tissues generally are a pretty aggressive chemical and biochemical environment, so the material can undergo degradation. Mineralization, this usually involves deposition of calcium salts onto the material and causing it to become brittle and then the device to become non-functional. And that's particularly important in, in bio-derived biomaterials, uh, the typical example being the, uh, the heart valve, the bioprosthetic heart valve, derived often from pig hearts. But the, big, the biggie here has, is not on that list yet, and now it comes in. And uh, the, the big problem with blood biomaterial interactions is, of course, that materials in contact with blood will provoke coagulation and thrombus formation inevitably. There's no material yet being found that doesn't do that other than the vascular endothelium itself. So that's what we're up against in this area. Uh, this shows an example of uh, an outcome, a thrombotic outcome, a catastrophic outcome of contact between blood and a prosthetic heart valve. This is a a tilting disc heart valve. And you can see that um, this has been explanted from a patient when it became non-functional. You can see this massive thrombus that has formed across the opening of the valve, which therefore can no longer open and close function normally the way it's supposed to do. Now, so the real question for us is, um, how do we get from the sort of innocent, if you want, first contact between blood and the surfaces of this valve and this horrible final catastrophic outcome of a thrombus, which causes the device to fail. So how do, we do it? how do we get from there to here? Well, we don't have all the answers to that, but I think one answer we do have is that it all begins with protein interactions, protein absorption, protein sticking onto the surface of the valve, and all the other effects follow from there. So let's just indicate um, a little bit about blood material interactions. Um, blood in contact with a biomaterial. First thing that happens is that proteins come to the surface and stick. They cover the surface within less than a second, I would say. And uh, everything else follows from that. And a few of them have, are listed here. Coagulation, white cell interactions, platelet interactions, leading to thrombus, complement into that activation, part of the immune response and even some good things, something that we might want to have happen, which would be fibrinolysis or clot dissolution. That's a natural body response as well, later on in the sequence. So our position here is that if we can control this initial event, this protein coating on the surface, which basically leads to everything else, then maybe we can stop. If we can control this, maybe we can stop coagulation white cell effects and so forth, and promote the ones that we want to happen by controlling this initial event. That's the position, that's the proposition that we're making here. Um, 
Now, I don't want you to leave this seminar with the impression that things are as simple as you might have got the impression they are from the previous slide. This is a bit more realistic uh, schematic of blood material interactions, and I won't take the time, obviously, to go into all of these boxes. Just want to point out again that things get started over here with the absorption of the initial protein layer and end up over here with the thrombus and possibly the embolus if it's an implant in the vascular system. And you have all these pathways uh, leading to fibrin, leading to platelet uh, aggregates and so forth and there are lots of interactions back and forth between them. It's quite complicated. But it all begins with protein absorption and so uh, this what I've just been discussing and a lot of research that's gone on, I would say, over the last more than 30 years leads us to this very simple paradigm of tissue material interactions, which is that when you put a biomaterial in contact with tissue, whether it's blood, soft tissue, hard tissue, first thing that happens is you get a layer of protein deposited. And then uh, later, later on, a bit later on, the cells will approach the surface and they will interact with the surface in ways that depend on which proteins they find there. And uh, usually, uh, so the cells will stick or not stick. If they stick, they'll undergo secondary responses, which could be good or bad, but usually in the case of blood contact, they're bad. And so knowing this uh, is the paradigm, if we accept that, then following from that, we should be able to say that design for a, of a material for a given objective, which might be antibacterial, anti-clotting, whatever, should exploit this paradigm. Knowing that this is the first thing that happens, we should be saying to ourselves, well, that is the interaction we should be focusing on. And we must be able to control that for a given objective. In turn, this leads to a uh, design, what, as far as we're concerned, at least in our lab, a design principle for biocompatibility based on controlling protein surface interactions. There are two components to this design principle. The first one is, that we must try to prevent non-specific interactions of proteins. Uh, Buddy Ratner, who I'm sure you've all heard of, uh, has said on many occasions that, where I've been present that non-specific, uncontrolled non-specific protein absorption is the enemy of biocompatibility. The enemy of biocompatibility. And I think that's an excellent way to make that point. Uh, if you don't stop non-specific absorption, you're going to get fibrinogen, which will cause platelet sticking and uh, many other things like that. So you have to keep the proteins off the surface. And I always say at this point, and when I'm discussing this, that uh, this is an unnatural thing to try to do. We all know about uh, nature abhorring a vacuum, right? Well, in my view, nature also abhors an interface in a biological system that is not covered with protein. So we're trying to go against nature by stopping proteins going in the surface. It's a very, very difficult thing to try to do. Um, a few of the ways that people have tried to do this is by attaching polymers, usually hydrophilic polymers like polyethylene oxide in particular, but others as well, dextrans, polyvinyl pyrrolidone have been used in this connection. That's one approach, and also I think the second classification of approaches here are phospholipid-like polymers, or even uh, phospholipid layers themselves, which is a, an attempt to mimic the plasma membrane of the cell, which after all does not absorb proteins non-specifically. So these two things are the main ways people have tried to do this. So that's one point of design principle. The second point is that besides keeping all the proteins off, we might be able to gain some advantage by promoting, I'm calling the selective exclusive binding of specified proteins. Proteins that we want to have there for one reason or another that we think will give us a beneficial effect in biocompatibility. And I'll give some examples of that later in the talk. And we do that, of course, by attaching ligands to the surface which will capture those proteins that we want to have there. And um, so, I, just to go back, um, I'm going to, in the rest of this uh, seminar, talk about one example here and one here from our own work. So polyethylene oxide is, uh, is the example I'm going to talk about. 
And uh, there's a, it's a simple polymer. It has this repeat unit. Why is this able to prevent proteins from sticking to the surface? Usually it's grafted uh, onto the surface at one end and free at the other. Uh, well, okay, here's the three points I make here. It's hydrophilic, it's highly hydrophilic. What binds water very tightly, usually through hydrogen bonding. And this kind of leads to what I call the water barrier explanation of why uh, polyethylene oxide keeps proteins away from the surface. The water is bound so tightly that when the protein tries to approach, it can't displace the water and therefore cannot interact with the PEO and with the surface underneath. PEO is not charged, so you can't have electrostatic interactions between um, the protein and the surface. Proteins like to do, uh, like to make uh, electrostatic interactions. They can't do it here. It's a very flexible chain. There's free rotation around the carbon-oxygen bonds, unlike carbon-carbon bonds. This makes the polymer easily deformed, uh, easily undergoing changes in conformation. So if it's attached and onto the surface, it can be compressed very easily as a protein approaches. And this leads to the idea of stark exclusion, um, which is explained very rather simplist simplistically in this cartoon. And so the idea is here that you have the polyethylene oxide or other polymer grafted to your base surface. This is just showing one chain. You have to imagine, of course, it's a fairly dense layer of PEO or other polymer. The protein comes in. It can't get to the surface. It can't interact with the PEO itself. So it pushes down uh, and compresses the chain, which is easily done, as I mentioned. Eventually, you reach a point where it can't be compressed anymore. There's an energy penalty in doing that. And this generates a repulsive interaction effectively, and the protein is pushed away from the surface. That's a nice simplistic explanation. Whether it's correct or not, I don't think anybody really knows at this point, but it looks good. So there was these two ideas, the water barrier and steric exclusion. Whatever the case may be, I want to tell you now about some work that we've done in this PEO area which is not grafting the polymer onto the surface, but rather it's using polyethylene oxide containing copolymers and using them as additives in polyurethane. So we just mix this copolymer, copolymer component into uh, polyurethane, a standard polyurethane as a matrix. And that turns out to be anti-fouling. And we've done a lot, we've done other systems containing PEO, but the reason I'm telling you about this one is it's the very, very best, we haven't published it, one thing, uh, which is always interesting in the seminar, I think. And uh, for another, this is the best way that we have found to, to do this. It's the simplest and the best. So the approach is uh, to, that we've, we've synthesized these uh, polyethylene oxide-based tri-block copolymers with this structure, PEO on the ends, and, and the polyurethane center block. And then uh, the, what we do is we blend those copolymers into a base polyurethane, which is then a matrix for the overall material. And the important point, too, is that the polyurethane in the middle block of this copolymer has a structure very similar to the matrix polyurethane, so that has implications as well. And so we expect that if we put this blend now in contact with an aqueous system, that since the PEO is hydrophilic, it will migrate so polymer, I should say, will migrate to the surface and will give us our anti-fouling effect, our protein resistance effect. And furthermore, that uh, the interactions will get interactions uh, between the middle segment of this copolymer and the matrix itself. And that should enhance the stability of the copolymer and effectively uh, help to anchor it at the interface. Otherwise, we might lose it into the, uh, the aqueous system. So here are three of these copolymers where I'll show you data on today. Um, you, you'll see them referred to as one, two, and three. And uh, the structures are very similar. They all have the same middle block of molecular weight, about 5,000, and different uh, molecular weight end blocks, 550, 2,000, and 5,000. And these correspond to, this is the number of ethylene oxide units. 12, 45, and 114. So these are oligomeric, I would say, rather than uh, high polymer 
PEO segments. So I'll cut to the chase right away. I could show you all kinds of characterization data and surface analysis, but what we're trying to do here is to demonstrate that we have a protein-resistant, non-protein following material. So here's an experiment uh, where we look at fibrinogen absorption either from buffer or from blood plasma, and this is how we do it. The key point is to label uh, fibrinogen with radioactive iodine. This allows you to trace it and to quantify it uh, on the surface. So uh, that's the protein in question. Um, Fibrinogen is a big protein, a molecular weight 340,000. Of course, it's a major component of blood plasma. It has this schematic structure here with a 2D domains and an E in the middle. It's a very asymmetric molecule, length about 460 and diameter about 90 angstrom units. This is, if you don't know the biological function of this protein, is to be transformed from this molecule into gel, the fibrin gel, which is the material of the blood clot. And that's, that happens by chopping off those fibrinopeptides in the E domain and it allows the molecule to self-assemble into a gel. So that's fibrinogen. And if we do that experiment I just mentioned in the previous slide, this is kind of typical data that we get. This is absorption from um, buffer, tris buffered saline, and there are blends of this copolymer where the PEO molecular weight is 550. So it's quantity absorbed on the y-axis and solution concentration on the x-axis, which is an isotherm effectively. That would be an isotherm if it was thermodynamically reversible, which it's not. But that doesn't particularly matter for this discussion. So here's the control, the polyurethane with no PEO, and this is typical. The protein absorption rises up pretty rapidly and levels off around one microgram per square centimeter. That translates into pretty tight layer of fiber engine where the surface is pretty well covered with a monolayer. Now, as soon as you start to introduce a little bit of this copolymer into the blend, your uh, absorption shoots way down. Even at the level of 0.5% by weight, you've lost about 95% of your protein layer. And as you blend in more and more of the copolymer, it go you can't see it too well in this because of the scale, but it goes down a little bit. So this is a pretty, I think, convincing for me at least demonstration of the effectiveness of this approach to uh, using PEO to obtain a non-fouling uh, surface. Show you some more data on that. Um, this shows the effect of the PEO block molecular weight on adsorption, and they're all loaded at the 5% by weight level. So I've got four surfaces here, the control, which you saw in the last slide, it's the same. And then um, Three, surf three blend surfaces containing copolymer 550, 2000, 5000. And you can see that it's the, small, the lowest molecular weight down here, which gives us the best result. Um, as we go up in molecular weight to 2000 and 5000, they become less effective in terms of protein resistant, resistance. This is an inverse dependence of protein resistance on molecular weight of the PEO because, I say inverse because uh, other people who've worked in this area uh, using grafted PEO on the surface find the opposite to that, that as the molecular weight goes up, the surface becomes more effectively non-fouling. Uh, but this is not a grafted surface, so maybe it isn't surprising that the dependence is different. We don't have the explanation for why at this point. It may simply be that uh, the lower molecular weight materials can crowd better into the into the surface and give you better coverage of EO, uh, of ethylene oxide units. Might be a transport effect where the smaller molecules or smaller assemblies can move faster to the surface. We actually don't think that's the explanation, but it is a possibility. So that's, that's from Buffer. Uh, the real true test of protein resistance, of course, is to put the material into a real biological system. And here's some data for uh, plasma now. The Surfaces have been placed in blood plasma, and uh, this again is copolymer 1 of PEO molecular weight 550, the best one. And um, it's the control, which looks like that, in the plasma system, and the copolymer, the blends with copolymers loaded in at these percentage uh, weight levels. 
So this is again adsorption quantity on the y-axis and it's percent plasma on the x. What we do here is we take undiluted plasma 100% and then we serially dilute it with TBS and this gives us a kind of equivalent isotherm or a plasma situation. So the main point to notice here is that there's a huge difference between the control and the blended materials, a huge decrease in protein binding in blood plasma now. And so this is another demonstration that these things work quite well. It may be of interest to some people to talk a little bit about this peak here. This is the infamous maybe Vroman effect peak. Uh, how many people here have heard of the Vroman effect? Not too many. Oh, it's fading in, in its infamy, I suppose. <laughs> uh, well, this is this, what you typically see for fibrinogen adsorption in a plasma system, and it, it reflects the fact that the fibrinogen, which is an abundant protein in plasma, tends to be adsorbed in, uh, in abundance initially. And later on, it's kicked off the surface by other proteins which are present at lower concentration in the plasma but have a higher affinity for the surface. That's, this is actually not a time axis, but it's, uh, it, it transposes that way. Anyway, uh, as you see, there's no Vroman effect whatsoever on those blended materials. And uh, so even at very low plasma concentrations and small times, there's just nothing on there. The surface doesn't want to absorb fibrinogen. Um, we've also done, uh, looked at other proteins in plasma, and this allows me to introduce our, uh, our, uh, one of our other techniques that we use in blood systems or plasma systems, and that is to do this, where we expose the surface to plasma, and then we elute the adsorbed proteins using a detergent, in this case SDS, and we take the eluted proteins and we run them on gels and identify the proteins by immunoblot analysis. And, I'm going to show you some data for some of those blended surfaces just using antibodies to a limited number of proteins. Fibrinogen, albumin, complement C3, uh, and apolipoprotein A1. Uh, you may not be familiar with this one too much, but we have found in recent work that this, this protein is, is there in spades in huge amounts on many, many surfaces that we look at. And uh, we think this is something that hasn't really been given enough at attention in the community over the years. ApoA1 is the main apoprotein on the high density lipoprotein particle. Whether adsorption of this reflects adsorption of the HDL particle or just the apoprotein, we don't know. Anyway, let me show you the data uh, for those blended surfaces again. So again, we're looking at the best of the bunch here, the PEO550. Um, molecular weight. This is the control with no PEO, the 5% PEO, uh, the 10% and the 20%. And the lanes are, these are standards of course, and the lanes are this, this is fibrinogen, this is C3, albumin and ApoE1. And I, I don't want to go into detail again on this, but you can see that the densities, this is controlled quantities of protein and eluate loaded onto the, the gels. There's a high density of staining here. Uh, it's less when you get to 5% blend, even less here. And here there's nothing. This uh, is just a background uh, which comes from the fact that the person who did this didn't wash long enough after the procedure to get rid of the background dye. There are no proteins uh, detectable at all here. This is a really, in my view, remarkable result, which, uh, which we've never seen on anything before. You know, it's, it's probably politically incorrect to brag about one's own data, but, but, but this, really, this really impresses me. Um, okay, now, uh, proteins, I said cells come after the proteins, and that's true. Here are some data that pertain to that. Um, this is an experiment where we looked at pro platelet adhesion and fibrinogen adsorption at, in the same experiment. And this time it's, it's, of course, from a whole blood system um, and under flow conditions. <coughs> this is for Larry McIntyre. All right, so um, anyway, this is, so we have on this axis uh, the platelet density on the surface, and on this axis the fibrinogen numbers. Uh, we uh, have uh, seven surfaces, three of them are over here based on the 550 molecular weight PEO. 
loaded at 1, 5, and 10 percent. And these three are for the 2,000, the bigger molecular weight PEO at 1, 5, and 10. And then the unmodified PU control. And you can see that um, the two phenomena follow each other, track each other quite nicely. You have the platelets uh, in the blue bars and the fibrinogen and the red dots. Of course, the scales are chosen, so they, they sit on top of each other like that. But anyway, the, these two things track each other quite nicely, as you would expect. Low fibrinogen, low platelets, high fibrinogen, high platelets. And that's exactly what you'd expect. So this suggests that when you do control the protein absorption, the cells kind of look after themselves. Uh, so what is the nature of the, just to go a little bit further with this, of this of the material aqueous interface on this material that makes it such a good non-filing surface? And in particular, how is the polyethylene oxide displayed at the surface to make this happen? Well, again, the short answer is don't really know. Uh, we have done some investigations to try to look at that. Here's something that would be totally unexpected to give you information along those lines. It's a scanning EM of the surface of a 20% blend of PEO550 copolymer after it's been extracted with toluene. Now, what's the significance of toluene extraction? Uh, that is that the copolymer is soluble in toluene and the matrix is not. So the idea here was to try to get a handle on the location of the copolymer in the blend. And sure enough, so what you see here is, is, um, is, is holes or pits in the surface, presumably where the PEO component has been extracted. And th this is 10 microns across, so the, the, whole, the pits are one to two microns in size and diameter, which is typical of microdomains that you find in blends of two homopolymers. So it looks like the, the blends have this typical uh, microstructure of microdomains of this two th one to two micron size. If you do this experiment with the matrix that doesn't have any PEO, then of course it's just a blend surface. You don't see anything. Um, so that's what it looks like. Now if you do, uh, if you look at the effect of toluene extraction on fibrinogen adsorption, that's shown here. It's the same materials I showed in the last slide. Um, so if you measure fibrinogen adsorption uh, on the matrix material with no PEO, you find that it doesn't make any difference. You get the same high fibrinogen adsorption whether it's extracted or not. If you do this on those blended materials with the 550, 2000, and 5000 material, you find that the low protein absorption before extraction shoots up dramatically and recovers back to the value that you had before you blended this PEO component in. So there's no doubt that the toluene extraction is removing PEO component. Here's another piece of information that helps us to think about the interface. This is some XPS data on oxygen content. Um, at the surface of these 2,000 PEO molecular weight blends. So it's atom percent oxygen, and uh, this is a, the loading of copolymer 2 into the blends by weight. Um, the blue bars are the expected bulk concentrations. So this would also be the surface concentration if the copolymer is uniformly distributed through the, through the matrix. And you see that goes from about 17% here. This is the matrix with nothing, with no PEO in it, up to maybe 19% uh, with 20% with of the copolymer blended in. If you, do the, if you look at the XPS data itself taken at 90 degree takeoff angle, you see that these pink bars are way above, uh, especially at the higher loadings, are way above uh, the blue bars, indicating an enrichment of PEO at the surface, as you would expect. And in fact, when you get to this one, the 20% one, you see that the number is about 26 atom percent of oxygen. And that is exactly the same comp atom percent that you have in the copolymer itself. And that suggests that the surface here is completely covered by the copolymer at that composition, even in the high vacuum atmosphere of the uh, XPS machine. And so uh, we, again, as I say, this, we, we're, this is ongoing work. We yet have to uh, come up with a satisfactory structure for this interface. But here's one idea. Um, and this would be like a cross-section cut down into the material now. 
Uh, we, we do have this domain structure. We have to deal with that. We have to deal with the fact that if it's like this on the surface, then there's all kinds of uh, matrix surface which is not got PU on it, which ought to absorb a lot of protein based on our uh, data. Um, and so what we're saying, I think, is that right at the interface here, there's, there's something that's equivalent to a complete layer of, of the copolymer. And that's what gives us a very high protein resistant characteristic. Of course, if you extract this with toluene, that will be removed. And you'll be left with the pit sort of distribution that you see. Anyway, that's, that's about as far as I can go with that. Um, I want to know for the last 10 minutes or so, um, hopefully not much more than that, uh, go to the second part of my um, design for, for uh, biocompatibility based on controlling protein absorption. So here, I'm saying, what I'm saying is that we can hope to design biofunctionality into our surface by controlling protein absorption as well. And this gets us into trying to capture specific proteins from the biological system. Um, so, so here are some examples of uh, things that you might want to do in the blood compatibility field at least to make this happen. I won't go into all the details. The idea is that you decide in some kind of functionality that you want. And then you say, what protein can I get on my surface that's going to do that for me? It's over here. And then having made that decision, you need to figure out a ligand that you can put on your surface to capture this protein. So that's kind of the, the, the algorithm, if you want. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about just one example here, and this is the one down here, uh, where we want to have a fibrinolytic surface, a clot dissolving surface. Uh, that means we'd have to capture the components of the fibrinolytic system, which are plasminogen and TPA, or tissue plasminogen activator, and we know that there's strong affinity for those two proteins in the, on the part of lysine, single amino acid lysine, very simple. So um, I'm going to talk about lysine der derivatized polyurethane as a clot lysine surface. Um, the idea here is that for, odd, for decades now, people have been trying to design surfaces that will not provoke coagulation. So in a sense, what we're saying is, OK, we, we just can't do that. Um, you know, we've, we give up. We can't prevent coagulation from happening. So, so we'll allow it to happen. And then in the process of that happening, we'll, this will trigger for us the process that dissolves the clot before it gets too big and too problematic. And uh, I should mention that the, the actual work I'm going to talk about here is a collaboration with Sermotics in um, Minneapolis. So the objective is, again, is to develop a clot lysing surface which would have the ability to lyse incipient or nascent microscopic clots before they become problematic. The approach is to have a surface which is selective for binding endogenous plasminogen and TPA, the components that you need to dissolve clots. We'd bind these components via lysine residues incorporated into the surface and of course we need to have the plasminogen be activated to plasmin which is the clot dissolving enzyme on the surface. That has to happen. So just to remind you um, about the fibrinolytic system, this is the system in the body which dissolves clots after they're no longer needed. You want the blood to clot and plug up the uh, breach in the vessel wall, but after a while you don't want it to be there, you want it to disappear, so it dissolves. And so here's the insoluble fibrin clot. It's acted upon by the enzyme plasmin, which breaks it down into small fragments of fibrin degradation products. Plasmin is not in blood normally. Plasminogen is, and so is the activator TPA, tissue plasminogen activator, and others. This is the main one. And so uh, you need to transform plasminogen into plasmin in order to get this action in dissolving the clot. And so our idea is, OK, let's get a surface which captures this protein and this one, and we'll have the components of fibrinolysis on our surface available to act if a clot ever happens to form, and we know it will. Um, so a word about plasminogen, the key player. 
And this, this, this is a schematic layout of the protein. It has a 94,000 uh, molecular weight. Its concentration in plasma is 0.15 milligram per ml. It's not a trace protein. It's not super abundant either. Uh, Kringle regions, are five of them, and two in particular, one and four, uh, bind with high affinity to lysine in the fibrin clot, lysine residues in the fibrin clot. It's convert this is converted, this is inactive against clots, but it has to be converted to plasmin with TPA. That involves uh, breaking a single peptide bond right here. And that's the only difference between plasminogen uh, and plasmin. This opens the molecule up and makes this uh, enzyme active area here available to act on the clot. So that's the basis of this. Our materials um, that we are working on to do this, to be clot dissolving, again, are based on polyurethanes. So this is, these are standard polyurethane components, MDI, PTMO, and ethylene diamine is a chain extender. The components are shown down here. If you can distinguish the different colors, it's not too important. Lysine is incorporated uh, in a coating reagent. This is, the, this is the somatics part of this project. And covalently attached to the polyurethane using photochemical methods. A little bit more about how the lysine is incorporated. There are two ways. Through the attachment through the alpha amine group of lysine. The lysine it looks like that chemically. There's two amino groups, an alpha and an epsilon. And you can therefore attach it to your coating reagent either through this one or this one. And uh, then uh, once having done that, you hit it with UV light and it attaches to your base polyurethane. It gives you a nice coating. So you can do it that way, or you can attach it through the alpha, through the epsilon amine group, uh, leaving the alpha amine free. And the distinction between this one and this one is very, very important because this is what lysine looks like in the clot, right? This, the alpha amine group is involved in forming the peptide chain, so it's this one that's free. And this is known to be active in binding plasminogen. This one is not. You need to have the free carboxylic acid group and the epsilon amine separated by this basic distance here for this lysine residue to interact with the Kringle lysine binding site one and four on plasminogen. That's well known. So we expect this to be used as a control if you want. Uh, it has lysine on it, it has all the other components, but it doesn't have the epsilon amine group free. So this will be the control and this will be, we hope, the active surface. Uh, so again, cutting to the chase, uh, let's look and see if this indeed does bind plasminogen from plasma. That's what we want it to do. It's the same experiment as I showed you for fibrinogen. We uh, label the plasminogen and add it back to the plasma and look at the uptake onto those different surfaces. Here's some data on that. This has already been published. And um, so it's adsorption of plasminogen this time and uh, percent plasma on the x-axis. This, the four surfaces, this is the control, which has lysine on it, but in which the alpha amine group is free, but not the epsilon. The epsilon is tied up. And there are three surfaces where the, uh, with lysine on them, where the epsilon amino group is free, and, but at different densities. It's interesting to look, to compare this curve, uh, the black one with the green one, they have the same density of lysine, namely 0.8 nanomoles per square centimeter. This one absorbs hardly any, and this one absorbs a significant amount. In fact, it's a factor of about 20 difference between them. So it shows you the really exquisite specificity of this epsilon amino group carboxylic acid combination for binding plasminogen. When we are up at this density here and 100% plasma, we have a monolayer of plasminogen on there based on this number which suggests that maybe we've got plasminogen and very little else on that surface, which is great. But we can show that, in fact, to be the case by doing this um, exposure to plasma, elution with SDS, and then run, running uh, gels and immunoblots. Here's some data from that. I won't go into the details on this. Uh, there are four panels. These are all immunoblots using antibodies to the proteins, which I'm sure you can't read the names of 
along the top. And uh, this, this panel is for the polyurethane, not modified at all. This is for the polyurethane that has the coating polymer on it, but no lysine. And this one has the alpha amine group lysine free. This is the one, the pièce de résistance, if you want here, which has the, uh, the same density of lysine again, but with the epsilon amino group available here and not here. And you can see that pretty well uh, these other, these three surfaces here absorb everything. You can see them all there. The one with the epsilon amino lysine group free absorbs a lot of plasminogen, a little bit of albumin, but effectively nothing else. We didn't really design this surface to be resistant to all proteins except plasminogen, but that's how it turned out. I suppose that's serendipity or something, but anyway, we have a lot of plasminogen on this, and um, we need TPA as well to, to generate uh, plasmin. So we, looked, we were interested to know if this surface would pick up TPA from plasma. We had tried to find it with the immunoblots, but couldn't probably because uh, TPA is only in plasma, a very, very low concentration, 5 nanogram per ml, something like that. So here's an experiment where we got purified TPA, and we labeled it with iodine-125, added it back to the plasma, and followed the uptake. And uh, without going into too much detail here, uh, you can see that here are the controls over here. This is the alpha lysine surface. This is the equivalent epsilon lysine surface, and you can see a very significant difference in absorption between those two. So it looks like this lysine surface has the capacity to pick up TPA as well, if the TPA is available to pick up. So it, this is all very well. Uh, the, the idea here is to have a clot dissolving surface. So the last question I want to mention or discuss here is, does this, can this surface dissolve clots? So it's intended design to be able to do. So we've got this assay that we worked, that we developed. It goes like as follows: plasminogen absorption step. We expose our surface uh, to pulled normal plasma, and we know from our experiments that we've done that it will pick up a lot of plasminogen from the plasma when we do that. Then. Um, we wash it carefully and we activate the plasminogen on the surface by exposing it to TPA at that concentration and for that amount of time. So now we assume that we have a surface that is coated with plasma. And that should be able to dissolve clots. So we wash that carefully to get rid of all the TPA. And then we form a clot around the surface by adding fresh plasma citrated plasma to the well and recalcifying and allow the clot to form or not form or form and then redissolve. We see what happens. And uh, the way we do that is to measure absorbance in the cuvette at 405 nanometers and we follow that uh, for 30 minutes at uh, body temperature. And of course, as the clot forms, the absorbance will go up, the light will be scattered. If, if it doesn't form, it won't change. If uh, the clot dissolves, the absorbance will come back down again. Typical data from one of those experiments. So this is clot formation and dissolution in plasma expressed as absorbance versus time. So four surfaces, two controls. This is. The red one is the polyacrylamide coating reagent with no lysine in it. And the blue one is the alpha amine free lysine, that's this one. And then we have two surfaces, a low density lysine surface where the epsilon amino group is free, that's this one. And a higher density of the same, which is this one. So here's zero time is where we add the calcium back and the clotting can begin, if it will. And you see it takes a few, three or four minutes for things to start happening. In the controls, uh, the absorbance just goes up in an S-shaped uh, curve and levels off and stays constant then over time. And the same thing basically happens with the alpha amine, the lysine, but which does not have the epsilon amine group free and therefore has not picked up the plasminogen and the TPA. With the active surfaces down here, the clot begins to form, but then at a given point in time, not too far into the time uh, 
scale. Uh, the curve turns over and comes back down again and goes back, in fact, all the way to the baseline, showing that the clot, or at least the absorbance, has gone back down again. So it looks like, in fact, that this, we take this at least as a good demonstration of the fact that these surfaces do have clot dissolving ability. That's, this is what that experiment looks like. Um, if you do it, this might be six or seven or eight minutes into the experiment, something like that. This is just a plasma with no surface, and you see the clot has formed. It's gone all cloudy. Uh, this is uh, the alpha lysine surface, so there's no effect. It's basically the same as that. The epsilon lysine surface at that point, this is only so the clot here has formed, and then it's beginning to redissolve. And it, it takes place at the surface. And this front, if you follow out in time, will go progressively from the surface right out to, the, to occupy the entire volume of this cuvette. So that's, that's our evidence um, so far that this is indeed a clot dissolving surface. So these are some of the conclusions from this, this part of the work. Um, I won't restate them. I think they've been obvious from what I've said. And um, overall, what I've tried to tell you in this, this, in this uh, seminar is we believe that control of protein surface act interactions is a valid approach to designing for biocompatibility. So I should say add QED or something to that. Um, why not? Uh, now, okay, so I, I'm done with the science. Um, I have to acknowledge a whole bunch of co-workers here. These are my colleagues and students uh, recently at McMaster, people at Sermotics have been involved in this um, clot dissolving surface work, uh, other people at, uh, in Sweden uh, whose work I didn't mention. And of course, funding from Canadian government um, agencies and industry as well. I'm not quite done, but uh, this is our campus at McMaster University in, in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, which doesn't look like that right now. <laughs> look pretty white <laughs> right at the moment. This is uh, the medical center which kind of dominates the campus, at least in that picture. This up here is the Niagara Escarpment. And um, this is the same geologic formation that Niagara Falls forms a part of. So if you follow the escarpment that way, and it sort of comes back, back this way from there, you come to Niagara Falls, uh, which is only 50 kilometers or so down the road from our campus. So if you come to visit McMaster, you get the added bonus that you can take an afternoon off and, and go and see the falls, which is a very nice thing to do. And finally, um, those of you who know accents, will know that I'm not a real Canadian. You figure that out. I'm really a Scotsman masquerading as a Canadian, I suppose, to some extent. And now this, this picture is of the campus of, of the University of Glasgow in Scotland, where I was a student a long time ago, quite a long time ago, when I think about it. And the statue uh, in the front here is of a very, very famous scientist probably the most famous professor who ever was a professor at Glasgow University in the 19th century. And I want to know if anybody here can guess who that is. I'm pretty sure you, don't, you wouldn't know him from the statue, or maybe even from the fact that he was a professor at Glasgow University. But I know you know him. You're going to be absolutely amazed. Maybe amazed, I don't know. Maybe somebody knows. Anybody know? Famous, the most, a very, very famous scientist that everybody who's a scientist or even a science student has heard of. I'll have to give you some clues. Uh, uh, well, I said 19th century already, didn't I? Uh, physicist? Thermodynamicist? No? towering figure of 19th century science. <laughs> Nobody knows. Huh? William Thompson. Who said that? Uh. You went to school with him. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise known as, now nobody's heard of William Thompson, right? He's also known as Lord Kelvin. Do you agree that he's a towering figure of 19th century science? 
Okay, I'm done now. Thank you very much. <laughs> I just, I, I just gave you an idea, right? <laughs> yes, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, the approach that you propose of both preventing non-specific protein absorption and then directing specific activity on the surface, I, I think that shows tremendous promise. And I think the, the ability to prevent non-specific absorption is clearly a critical component of that approach. Now, you present very remarkable data with this uh, PDO change. But you still have some level of absorption, and people like Tom Horvath would say, any little bit is going to kill you. So my question is, there are other types of surfaces that have been used, like oligosaccharide moieties and things like phospholipids. Do you think those may provide some sort of a better control that prevented protein absorption? or do you? Because they appear to have different, the reasons why PE, G and PEO degrade over time are not as evident on those other groups. And do you think those may be more promising, as promising? Yeah. Well, I, I think I mean, there are two, two, two points to answering that. One is that I think that, uh, as you say, there's other, many other things that have been tried. Dextrans, for example, a lot, uh, polyvinyl pyrolidone, other hydrophilic polymers. I, I think polyethylene oxide is, has given the best results. Not just what we, we've done, but other people as well. I, I think the PEO and, and various guises and various techniques has given the best results, the most protein-resistant surfaces. But you're right to point out that who knows uh, over time, you know, is this going to last or do we need something else to make it permanently thromboresistant or th uh, protein-resistant? And um, I, it may well be that things like the phospholipids uh, or the phospholipid-like polymers, these um, you know, MPC polymers that the Japanese are using, for example, might be better. It remains to be checked out. It really does. Um, but you're right to say also that there isn't any surface that, that resists protein, that gets it down to zero, exactly zero, within the limits of detection. Yeah. So, so this is correct. What you say is, is right. We haven't got there yet. And I think we do need to get lower than we have got at this point. You know, Tom Horvitz says you need uh, no more than five nanograms, I think it is, of fibrinogen per square centimeter to prevent platelet uh, adhesion. And that's a pretty small amount of fibrinogen. I'm pretty sure we're not there yet. With your uh, PEO, the 550 uh, yes. PEOs, I wonder, uh, because this is a blend, um, if there's any mechanical, uh, as, as in polyurethane, one might anticipate some mechanical motion if there is leaching and, and such. Uh, going to the stability argument earlier. Yeah. Uh, well, we don't have a lot of information on that yet. Um, what we have done is to immerse some of these materials uh, in plasma and um, for as long as a week, and uh, we, we then have checked whether the protein uptake is altered or not, and, uh, and it's not. Uh, so they're stable at least for that amount of time. If, if they really are uh, these microphase separated structures that I showed uh, with, a, with a strong uh, you know, layer of PEO copolymer at the surface, that might, because they are somewhat soluble, not really highly soluble, they're somewhat soluble and aquously soluble. So effectively, it would be a renewing surface, if that's the case. But you'd be losing the PEO component from the surface, but it would regenerate from within the bulk. Now, up, up to a limit, of course. Presumably, you deplete it at some point. So that, that's about all I think I can, can say. Uh, but yes, uh, there is that possibility that, that it's leaching away. But it would be slow, I think. Uh, that, that's why, if you just put PEO, itself into something like that. It will be lost very, very quickly, within hours. Yeah. It will be lost. But that's, that's the idea of the copolymer, and especially the polyurethane uh, center block with a polyurethane matrix. Can you use different molecular blend copolymers? Do you see an effect of increasing the Be enough to explain why you have more 
Right. Well, that was one thing that we thought of uh, when we first saw this uh, inverse molecular weight dependence. Uh, it could be. Uh, we still don't really know if that's true or not. Uh, sort of one argument against it is that if you do uh, contact angle measurements on these surfaces, uh, if you look at contact angle kinetics over time, in other words, follow the contact angle over time, you find that it, you get the same kinetics uh, whether it's the high molecular weight or the low. So that, that argues against the transport explanation. But it's a, it's a question that I can't really give a definitive answer at this point. I don't know, are there any transport specialists in here that, that could uh, address that? We're not. Yeah. yeah, these th so this is speculation hypothesis. To, yeah. yeah, well, I mean, I've seen this this uh, motion thing before. And I, I'm not sure that people believe that too much anymore. But uh, but we're we're groping for answers here. There's no doubt. But, you know, most people, as I say, find that uh, the molecular weight dependence is that you get better uh, non-fouling as the molecular weight goes up. It levels off. But when you get to something like 2,000, you don't get any additional benefit by going higher than that. But, but the low ones, you know, the small ones like high 50 with 12 P units would not be as effective as 2,000 if it was a grafted surface with the same density. But this, these are unanswered questions, I would say. Yeah. Can I ask a more general, perhaps philosophical question in the sense that this is a tissue engineering <laughs> center at Digitech, and the whole non-fouling approach uh, kind of uh, is contrary to the idea of promoting integration and cellular uh, uh, colonization, if you will, of the surface that's favorable. So I guess I wonder if you could share your thoughts on if, you, if we indeed get there and make a stable uh, non-fouling surface, would that also then preclude the cells eventually when they get there making their own matrix and becoming comfortable and making an integrated product, um, which one might argue is, would be a desirable end. But, so that I see a sort of philosophical conflict yeah. if we take things down. Well, that's right. I mean, the, the objectives are different in, in tissue engineering. You want the cells to be on there and happy and interacting in a beneficial way and prospering and proliferating. And you need the proteins there to do that. So a non-falling surface, obviously, it would not be, I think, it might work. I don't know. It's hard to say. It might well be just great. Who knows? But, you know, ab initio, uh, uh, on the face of it, knowing what we know, that we do want intimate contact, and we do want, in, which is, usually takes place through a protein intermediate, right, in the case of yeah. cells putting out their own yeah. matrix and so forth. And if the proteins don't want to be there, then that's probably not a good thing. But, but if, if we also incorporate the idea that we want just those specific proteins that, that are the right ones to have, then this is okay. Right? So it's, it's, it's both components of the design principle, non-following only, only the proteins there that you want to be there <laughs> and nothing else. I don't think that's in conflict. This would be effective. Okay. I understand with the PEO surfaces that they do prevent protein absorption and platelet adhesion. I think there still occurs platelet activation um, because of transient contact and stuff. What, do you know any reasons for that, or how can that be? Um, no, uh, the simple answer is I don't know any reasons for it. Um, it's surprising, to say that much. Um, is it a shortened lifespan for the platelets, or? or or is it that they, uh, they secrete, they undergo the release reaction, uh, even though My they... My understanding was that they, they transient contact would be enough, or because of incomplete coverage of... Um, 
sort of, but it's well known in general that platelets hit the surface. And, and Larry, you've worked on this area too, I think. Yeah. Platelets, platelets hit the surface, uh, but don't stick. They're, they're still altered. And the, Yes, the yes. The shorter yes. the plate lifespan. That's right. If yeah. it looked at the surface, it looked clean. So it was, of course, not fouling, but the plate lifespan was short in an animal in vivo. If right. you look at it closely, they were showering small platelets off, some small embryo all the time. So but the implication was... Something was happening. There was transient absorption that were leaving. If you just look at one time point, it looked like it was wonderful. But if you look at dynamically, you saw things happening all the time. That was a long time ago. Oh yeah, they, these the ones you're talking about were polyacrylamide uh, surfaces. We are we are in the process of doing that, <laughs> but I don't have the uh, anything definitive to say about that yet. But yes, uh, yeah. So I you know I don't know, but there's the non-adhesive platelet alterations or non-adhesive interactions of platelets with sources is a, is a well-known phenomenon, as, as you know. And uh, you, you can get adverse effects on the platelets without having them stick permanently on the surface. 